Martin has ordered his grandfather's military service records from the Ministry of Defence. So these are his Territorial Army papers. This is when he signed up for the County of Yorkshire to serve in the the RAMC. I don't know what the RAMC is. So he died. It says died 24th of the 5th, 1940. Being killed in action. Blimey. Here he is. Tim Canterbury. Good man. The Canterbury Tales <laughs> of Chaucer. Yep. And Shakespeare. I'm the youngest of five. Uh, Dad, Geoffrey, Mum, Philomena. Then it goes Benedict, Laura, Tim, Jamie, and me. That's who we are. I think my parents met at a party, I would guess in about 1956 or 7. They were married at the end of 1957. They split up uh, in the 70s, and uh, my dad died when I was 10. He had a heart attack. At the time, I wanted to show people, oh, I'm all right, I'm OK. I'm, I'm a brave little, you know, four-foot thunderball. I've only realised how tough it is as I've got older. In the normal run of life, you just have, you know, late-night chats or drunk chats or whatever it is that, you know, you have with your parents as you're growing up. But I never had those conversations with my dad, you know. Um, and I'm sure I would have loved to have had them, you know. Because as it is, I, it's sort of, I know embarrassingly little about his side of the family, you know. I'm hoping what I found out will affect me, but I'm not full of trepidation about it. I, I honestly just think it's very human to want to know about where you're from. Martin lives in Hertfordshire with his partner and their two young children. There's a big sort of hole in my knowledge of my dad's side of the family. My dad lost his dad the same age I lost my dad. And I must have heard from him initially that his dad had died in the war. So that probably turned into him being a war hero. I don't, you know, I don't know the way that families, you know, myths develop from facts. So I'm interested about my grandfather's death on my dad's side. My understanding always was that he had died serving in the Second World War. But I don't know if that's true. Again, among five kids, and when you're the youngest anyway, you know, by the time it's got down to you, anything could have happened, you know, as far as the truth is concerned, you know. We're off to see my brother Tim at his house. He was around for more of my parents' marriage. He was around for more of my dad's life. So I'm hoping he remembers more stuff than I know. I suppose because I never knew my granddad, obviously, because he died. Um, it's just so distant, you know. Hey, Martin. Martin. Here. Yeah. Pretty well, Tar. Come in, see. Nice. Tar, oh, just it's finished. Lovely. It's lovely. I'm guessing a cup of tea. Ah, oh, please, yeah, thank you. Take sugar in this, please. Thank you. <laughs> Do you remember Dad ever talking about his his side of the family or his dad in particular? What happened in the war and how he met his end? I know more than he died. Right. I know that he did, well, I know, uh, yeah. I think I know, he died in Dunkirk. Mm. And Dunkirk is such a kind of famous yeah. part of the war, isn't it? I'm wondering whether that is just another, yeah. been put, tidied into a yeah, kind of big yeah. box, put Dunkirk on that sort of thing. Mm. But the, the hook that Dad always used to say, mm. that he was shot uh, making a round of tea. Someone told me that they thought he died while stealing something. <laughs> Sugar for tea? Sugar for tea, maybe. Oh, that would be bad. I've got, I've got a photo of Leonard. Look. Blimey. That, what, what, do you, what do you think? I mean, to be honest with you, putting it next to a photo of Dad here, I just felt like I was looking at Dad. What, there? Yeah. Really? Look at the insignia. Go on. 
Well, I can't tell you who, who, who I, I used to know my army insignia. That really rings a bell, that snake round a downward thing. No idea what regiment at all. Anything really about my dad's dad is a, a bonus because I know so little about it. I know that he was a man who died 30 years before I was born, uh, who died during the war. I mean, if I could find out the details of how he died, that would be interesting, of course, yeah, and the sort of when and where and the how. Martin has ordered his grandfather's military service records from the Ministry of Defence. So these are his territorial army papers. This is when he signed up for the county of Yorkshire to serve in the, the RAMC. I don't know what the RAMC is. So he died, it says died 24th of the 5th, 1940, being killed in action. Blimey. God, it's just amazing, because you've you got all this stuff happening in the records, just very sort of perfunctory and everything, and they're just in big sort of block capitals, they just put died, you know, whenever someone dies, I guess they just, there's not much else to say, it's just kill, killed in action. Tim mentioned uh, Dunkirk. We can see if that date tallies. 24th of May with when Dunkirk was. Well, according to this, the Battle of Dunkirk was the defence and evacuation of British and Allied forces in Europe from the 26th of May to the 4th of June, 1940. And he died on the 24th of May. So if he was in Dunkirk, then he just missed the evacuation. He died a few days before. Martin's visiting the Imperial War Museum in London. I'd like to know if it's possible, I don't know if it is possible, or if it's actually not ghoulish to find out exactly how he died. Do you know what I mean, in what situation? He's meeting military historian Professor David French. This is some family history. My grandfather, Leonard, uh, died, I believe, maybe at Dunkirk. OK, right. So the RAMC, what's that? Royal Army Medical Corps. Oh, right, that's what RAMC. RAMC. I wasn't sure that um, stood for These you. are the guys who run the Army's hospitals. So war starts in September. Yep. The British Expeditionary Force... British go... Expeditionary Force goes over <coughs> to France, dribbles over to France. The territorial divisions, yeah. um, of which... Leonard is a member, um, start going over in January okay. 1940. Um, and Leonard's unit um, is the 150th um, field ambulance. On the 10th of May 1940, the German army advanced into Belgium and Holland. The British and French armies responded by pushing northeast into Belgium, from where they expected the main thrust of the German army to come. But the Germans outwitted them, attacking simultaneously from the south. By coming behind the Allies, the Germans cut off the elite of the British and French armies from their command centers back in France. The result was chaos. The British Expeditionary Force was cornered by the Germans in a rapidly shrinking pocket of northern France. The Allied troops began to retreat to the channel port of Dunkirk for evacuation. So, all the time that they're retreating, they are involved in skirmishes and battles all that time. They're not just being chased. I mean, there are, there's, well, they're engaging with the enemy. All they're the time. engaging with the enemy. Most of them are being bombed and strafed by the Luftwaffe. The 
infantry are fighting a series of rearguard actions um, which go on really right until the last day of the evacuation. The constant bombing and shelling meant that Leonard Freeman's field ambulance unit was dealing with mounting casualties in increasingly chaotic conditions. Medical supplies and vehicles were being destroyed and lines of communication were broken. By the 24th of May, Leonard's unit was outside the city of Lille, still some 50 miles from Dunkirk. So the evacuation starts on the 26th, 27th? The evacuation starts 26th, 27th. It's over and done with by the 4th of June. Well, Leonard died on the 24th. Yeah. We've been doing a little bit of research, and one of the things we found is the war diary of Leonard's unit, the 150th Field Ambulance. God. And you might want to look at the entry for the 24th of May, 1940. Certain artillery units arrived at Chateau Grounds at Hooplan, where the unit had landed up. Enemy planes coming over, about 0800 hours, bombed the ground. Our unit sustained two dead and 13 wounded. They were bombed. They were bombed by the Luftwaffe first thing in the morning. So do you think it's possible that one of those men could have been Leonard? Two dead, 13 wounded. It's right. possible. Yeah. Can't say any stronger than that. It's possible that Leonard might have been right. one of those two men. We can't be absolutely certain, though, yeah. because he's not mentioned by name. To find out if Leonard was one of the two men in the war diary who died, Martin is travelling to Hull, where Leonard's military unit was based. I knew roughly what had happened at Dunkirk, but I didn't really know in the days leading up to it. I was very hazy on that and what did lead up to the, the big story that we all kind of have heard about. I, I'm just after anything I can find out. Anything I can find out is a bonus. When Leonard Freeman signed up in 1939, the headquarters of the 150th Field Ambulance was at Wenlock Barracks. Martin has come here to meet Captain Peter Starling of the Royal Army Medical Corps. Hello, Captain Starling. Martin, Martin how are you? Doing? Welcome nice to Wenlock to Barracks. Thank you very much indeed. So this is now a, a squadron of a, of a regular medical group. The 150th Field Ambulance was a division of the Territorial Army. To support the Royal Army Medical Corps' teams of doctors, Leonard and his fellow volunteers would have received basic medical training. This manual here is the 1935 RAMC training manual. Really, right. It um, has basic stretcher drill in it. It has right. everything from anatomy, physiology. Mm -hmm. It's everything he would need as an tome, RAMC actually, soldier. It? it is, yeah. Yeah, that's quite a, a big one. So he would have had one of these? Yeah. In the days leading up to the evacuation, Leonard's medical training was put to good use. While other Allied soldiers were racing to the beaches of Dunkirk, Leonard's unit was miles from the coast and under constant German attack. He would have had a very important job. His job was to treat the wounded there, really? you know, under, under the direction of the medical officer. Yeah. Would have told him what he wanted him to do, check their dressings, put right. the splints on. Yeah. So a very important job. Um, there is an account of 150 that's been compiled by a long-time member of this unit, mm. Captain Brian Hemmerman, mm. and it's based on Lieutenant Colonel J. Morrison's account. And Lieutenant Colonel Morrison mm. was the commanding officer. Colonel Morrison's account gives more details of what happened on the day Leonard died. 24th. Blimey. Uh, 24th of May. 0500 hours, certain ancillary units arrived at Chateau Grounds at Hooplan, where the unit had laid up in and around Secklin Wood. Once again, the screaming Stuka Dawn patrol came, bombed and machine gunned the wood. Four of our lads killed, including Private L.W. Freeman. Wow. It's quite, yeah, it's, uh, it's... But it tells you exactly... exactly um, it confirms it what does, happened yeah. to him it on does, the 24th yeah. of May 1940. That name really leaps out of that paragraph. Yeah. Mm. 
there's one more thing I would like to show you before you leave here today. Okay. But just watch this step as yeah. we go up. What we're going to do is go over here and have yeah. a look at this memorial. So this is memorial to the 150 Field Ambulance 1939-1945 war. Hmm. And there he is. There he is. Oh, that's fantastic. <clears throat> I don't think this was here all the time. You know, all this information is here. But I didn't know about it, no. So there's, you know, his name's been in stone, literally, in a building up in Yorkshire. That's good, I'm glad. On the 26th of May, 1940, one of the most daring military operations of the Second World War began. Over a period of 10 days, nearly 340,000 Allied troops were successfully evacuated from Dunkirk, including all but nine of Leonard Freeman's unit, the 150th Field Ambulance. For Leonard, the evacuation had come too late. Quite flawed, actually, it was quite flawed. Uh, I mean, why? Sh I don't know why it should be that just seeing something in stone has a different effect on you. Maybe that's why they put things in stone, because it definitely... I felt very moved, and uh, like it was... something definite, you know. Uh, and every, every bit that I go on the journey, it, <clears throat> things become just a bit more real, you know, from someone who was so abstract and who I didn't really think of, you know, that I didn't spend much of my life thinking about Leonard, which I feel slightly embarrassed about now. It's a few days later, and Martin is back at home. Obviously, Leonard's story is great, it's fantastic that I've learned about it, and I'm really glad that I have. But I don't know if he had brothers or sisters, I don't know about his parents, any of the meat on those bones, I would like to find out. Martin's got a copy of Leonard's birth certificate, giving him the names of Leonard's parents, his own great-grandparents. So his father was Richard William, so his mother was Ada Louise Freeman, formerly Meldrum. Rank or profession of father, organist. I would imagine that was quite a big deal. I'm looking up their marriage certificate to find out a little bit more about them. It says, sorry, we found no matches. They've got a birth certificate. Both of them have signed it. If they're both on a birth certificate, but there's no marriage certificate, um, I'd need to find out about them as individuals, because they're both obviously there. Without a marriage certificate for Leonard's parents, Martin's hit a dead end. To get some help, he's arranged to meet genealogist Jenny Thomas. Hello, Martin. Nice to meet you. Nice to see you. Thanks, Thanks for you. seeing me. Jenny may be able to solve the mystery of the missing marriage certificate. I've hit a bit of a, a cul-de-sac, and, uh, and I just need some help, basically. Right. Quite a lot of people hit the same brick wall. Mm. Sometimes the marriage may not have taken place, but actually, sometimes as well, Names have just slipped through the indexes. Human error, names slipped through. But you can carry on building a family tree even without a document. 
and I've managed to do that a little bit with your great grandfather, Richard yeah. William Freeman. Okay. And I've got some documents Lovely. I think you might be interested in. This is the first one. Thank you. Right, so this is Richard's birth certificate. Right. Right, so he was born in 1853, Richard William. Well, he would have been quite old. He would have been quite old when he had Leonard. Uh, he would have been sort of 56, sort of thing. Yes. If he was born in 1909. Yes, right. Yeah. So he was born in Surrey? He was, yes. Right, OK, that's interesting. I don't know where St Olaf's, I don't know where that is. It's near the Bermondsey area. That's very interesting, because Leonard was born in Hull. I wanted to find out how long the family had been in Hull. Uh, and so clearly, it was so clearly they weren't always in Hull because Richard was born in London. That's right. Right. That's right. That's very interesting. Jenny's also found Richard in the 1871 census, when he was 18 years old, living in Hampstead, North London. So there he is. So he's 18. He's a scholar. That's right. Right. Well, blind from birth. That's right. There's a special column in the census denoting somebody's disability. Right. <laughs> and if you look at the address, he's in a special school. It a says blind, blind school. school. Right, yeah. God. <laughs> God. Right. Amazing. Amazing. I'm guessing this school is long gone, right? It's certainly not in the same location. It's actually moved, but it does have an archive. Its records are preserved, and they're held at the Royal London Society of the Blind at its school in Kent. Richard's school was run by the Royal London Society for teaching the blind to read. In the 1950s, it moved to Seven Oaks in Kent. Those lovely grounds. I'd love to find out about what life would have been like, and maybe if they've got anything about Richard. I'd be amazed if they've got anything about him specifically. I just imagine life being pretty tough for a blind person if you're born in 1853. Alison. Hi. I'm Martin. How are you? How are you doing? Nice I'm to meet fine, you. thanks. And you? Good. Martin's meeting Alison Neild, who's done some research in the school's archives. We do have some photographs. Great. That you can look at. Right. Boxing. Yeah. You wouldn't know any of them were blind, did you? No. It just looks like no. a load of boys playing. Yeah. Amazing. Looks like a beautiful place. OK, well, I think we've got some more information here that you might find interesting. Great. I don't know if you can read it. Oh, well, uh, So, from there... Application was made by Mrs Freeman um, of 37 Albert Street, Bermondsey, Bermondsey, right, yeah. for the admission of a little boy, eight years old, to the institution. He's been... Oh, man. He's been blind from his birth. His father is a mariner with five other children and they pray to have him admitted at the lowest sum charged by the society. How f fascinating. His parents, obviously, were forward-thinking people. Yeah. And they had, by the look of it, five other children. God. So um, they would have had their work cut out to look after them and to make sure that Richard was on the right track, given his yeah. disability. So. Yeah. Richard Freeman's parents took advantage of progressive developments in blind education in Victorian Britain. Before, education for the blind had been sparse. Poor blind people often ended up on the streets as buskers or beggars. But by the middle of the 19th century, all that was to change. Victorian reformers were determined that the blind should live self-sufficient and independent lives. They set about establishing specialised schools for the blind, dedicated to literacy and vocational training. By 1871, when Richard Freeman was 18 years old, there were over 50 schools for the blind in Britain. It's 
this makes interesting reading. It's the Ladies' Committee. Okay. So what does that mean? Well, they sort of governed the school. Right. Okay. Yeah. Richard William Freeman, having absented himself from the school since, since the 1st of March, his parents informed us that he had falsely represented first that his holidays were for a whole week, and secondly, that he had returned at the end of them but was told to go home by matron for the purpose of undergoing an operation. He is to be sent to bed <laughs> immediately after tea for 14 days, during which period he will also forfeit pudding for dinner. <laughs> So he said to the school, I've got to go for a week, and he said to his mum, yeah, I've been I'm sent for an operation. <laughs> That's a mad lie, isn't it? It's a silly lie. So he's obviously a bit of a tinker. Yeah. I see, just up here as well, I see uh, several of the pupils are qualified to undertake the situation of organist. Yeah. Was there a big musical input here? Yeah, he would have learnt to play the organ here. Right. In the 19th century, music was thought to be a suitable profession for the blind. Many blind people were encouraged to train as organists and piano tuners, earning considerably more than their colleagues employed in the more traditional blind trades of furniture making and basket weaving. Piano tuners also received instruction in manners and etiquette, giving them a coveted entry into middle-class society. I, I think know. I've got something else that might enlighten you. OK. So, there we go. We have Richard Freeman, entry 203. If you go across, you will see that he became a tuner at Worthing, Sussex, in 1887. Blimey. So he became a piano tuner. Amazing. Yeah, I wonder why he went down there. Yeah. <laughs> Martin's following Richard's trail to Worthing on the Sussex coast. I'd like to find out what took him to Worthing to be a piano tuner and then what took him to Hull to get together with his wife. Leonard, my grandfather, was the first child of Richard. That would be Richard starting a family very late in his 50s. I can't believe he didn't have a pop at it before then. Martin's visiting Worthing Library to search through the local records. Hi, Jane. Hello, Martin. Hello. Nice to see you. Welcome nice to, to see Worthing you. Library. Thank you. Thank you very much. Librarian Jane Dorr has directed him to the local newspaper, the Worthing Gazette. Oh, look at that. It's right where I stopped. R. W. Freeman is desirous of obtaining a connection as a pianoforte tuner, is thoroughly experienced. He's prepared to supply pianofortes, American organs, harmoniums, etc., for cash. Blimey. It says organist of West Tarring Church. So he was already the organist of the church. So he's well established now. Um, now, I've been curious as to what brought Richard to Worthing from London. Um, why come here as a piano tuner? Worthing was a, quite a prosperous, growing town at that period. Um, economically, it was growing. Wealthy people were coming in. Right. There was a lot of building, right. um, a lot of concert halls being right, built, yeah. private schools being built, a lot of work for a piano tuner. He was also dealing in he keyboards as well. He was also dealing in them, yes, right. so selling them. Yeah. So, uh, so here, West Tarring... Mm -hmm. um, it's a little village on the outskirts of Worthing, mm. but with a quite an important church. Very old so a very church. established church. Absolutely, mm. yes. Not that you would advertise in the paper, but, where, you know, I don't know if he was living with anyone here. I don't know if he was... Uh, you know, married or engaged or whatever, you know, if he was just being a bachelor here. Um, I'm very, I am still, you know, I keep banging on about that side of his life just because I think it's, that's the most important part of anyone's life, you know, is uh, who you're sharing it with. When Richard Freeman lived in West Tarring in the late 19th century, St Andrew's Church was home to a large and prosperous congregation.
Martin's come to meet parish historian Chris Green. Thanks for seeing to Welcome you to St Andrew's West Towing. Thank you very much. Do you have any references or information about my great-grandfather you could show me? Yes. We are very fortunate in this church mm. to have the parish magazine going mm -hmm. back to 1893. Right. And we have a reference mm. in this magazine as to what items he could play up to oh, really? pure choral music. Right. Thanks. An organ recital of sacred music from the works of the great composers was given by Mr. R. W. Freeman on the afternoon of the 5th of February. The weather, unfortunately, proved to be exceedingly wet and stormy so that many were prevented from attending. Mr. Freeman played a selection of organ music from the compositions of Mendelssohn, Haydn, Bach, Hess, Handel, is that Guno? Guno. Guno. I'm such a Philistine. Uh, Rossini, Hopkins and others. The way in which our organist played the difficult compositions of Bach and Hess showed with what a wonderful musical memory he has been endowed. Right, OK. So we know he was a very good player then. Quite outstanding. Yeah. To play all those great composers, or yes. the works of great composers. Yes. By memory. Yes. Yeah. Now, Richard had my grandfather, Leonard, in about 1909 when he was in his mid-50s. Now, I've been curious all along uh, as to whether he'd been married before that, whether he'd had children before that. Is that anything you can enlighten me on? Yes, if we go back to the 1881 census. Right. Right. At 29, he was married to Fanny Freeman. They had a daughter, Elizabeth, and a son, Richard. That's right. Right. Elizabeth was five and Richard was three. Right. Well, that's a question answered for me. Far from starting his family with Martin's great-grandmother in Hull, Richard Freeman had a wife and children in West Tarring as far back as the 1880s. And they could afford to live in one of the largest houses in the village. This is a very prominent property in the high street. So when Richard moved here, he must have been doing exceptionally well. Mm. Hello, hello, James. James. Hello, hello. hello. I'm Martin. Martin. Hello, nice to meet you. Thanks for having us. Today, the house is lived in by Jane Wells and her family. It's lovely. Excellent. Glad you like it. With its spacious accommodation, the Hollies was the perfect home for a growing family. I'd like to show you the 1891 census. All right. Hang on. Richard William Freeman, Elizabeth is daughter. Yes. Richard is son. Charles. Yes. Alfred. Herbert. And uh, Philip. Philip. Mother yes. of Jesus, he got busy. He was very busy. Yeah. Amazing. So there's lots of ch children here. I can't see Fanny. According to the Bourbon Gazette of February 1891, she died. How sad. That's terrible. It is. That's really, really sad. Yes. She died of heart failure. Really? Mm -hmm. So... Oh, God. We have a marriage certificate here. Richard William Freeman and Emily Carter were married in October 1891. And then this birth certificate that they had a daughter mm. called Emily Cecilia. Cecilia, lovely. <sighs> Given that before I met you in the church, I was wondering, did he have any kids before? You know, and it transpires he had like a... <laughs> quite a few. Yeah, Plus quite a two few, yeah. previous... Yeah. Wives. By the middle of 1893, Richard Freeman had been married twice. First to Fanny Gillett, and then to Emily Carter, and had a total of seven children, ranging in age from 17 years to five months. At 40 years old, he'd successfully climbed the ladder to middle-class prosperity. But the following year, in 1894, Richard's life in West Tarring began to change. 
The circumstances under which the post of organist at Taring became vacant are well known to our readers. After very careful consideration, the rector and church wardens have appointed, have appointed Mr. W. Binstead, organist of Sompting Parish Church, to the vacant post. Is this very diplomatic when it says the circumstances under which the post of organist at Taring became vacant are well known to our readers, i.e. we don't have to bring it up here? But it does seem most strange, a highly respected organist either left mm. or was asked to leave. Yeah. You know, it really is incredible. The other thing which comes up is what happened to Emily. Yeah. Because as far as we can find out, there is no death certificate. Really? You wonder if she left him mm. for some reason or another. Because we do find by the 1901 census that all these children are scattered all over the place. One we know died in 1895. Two were found to be living in London, two in Sussex, and one was unaccounted for. So, yeah, so they're all scattered to the four winds. They seem and to be, And we can't yes. find Emily. No, we certainly can't find his second wife. Can we go anywhere from this? I mean, have we hit a dead end there? I don't think we're ever going to find out precisely what happened and therefore it becomes a bit of a closed story mm. so far as we are concerned here at Taring. There's a bit of a mystery and it seems that it's one that we won't be able to get to the bottom of for sure. I guess I could look at um, Ada and see where her story might meet his, um, which would provide hopefully answers or at least clues as to why he ended up in Hull and where they met. Richard Freeman left Worthing in 1894. For a few years, there's no trace of him. But before the end of the decade, he surfaces again, nearly 300 miles away in Hull. And he's married to his third wife, Martin's great-grandmother, Ada Meldrum. Back at his hotel, Martin is looking through the census records. I want to find out what brought him to Hull, what brought him to my great-grandmother, Ada. How do they uh, hook up? What I'm going to do is look up the 1901 census, which is the next one after he left in late 1894, um, and see if I can uh, find a match of him and Ada. Richard Freeman, head of the family. He's 48 by now. He's a music teacher. Got Ada Louise, who's 28. So she's much younger. She's a music teacher as well. <sighs> and she's blind. How interesting. And two, and two sons. Philip and Richard was born in Hull. So I'm now getting up the 1911 census, 10 years on from the last one. Who have we got here? So they got Philip from before, Richard. Mabel, who's three. Ada, who's two. Leonard, my grandfather, who's one. And Hilda, who's six months. There's, there's a lot of Freemans, you know, from, just from Richard. I've, I, I, genuinely, I'm not being glib, I've actually lost count of his children now. The census also reveals something else about Richard and Ada's children. It says, children born alive to present marriage. They've got 12 as the answer to that. Twelve children born alive. Yeah, so they've lost six children. Six children have died. That's horrendous. The census reveals that by 1911, Richard and Ada were bringing up five of their own children 
plus one, Philip, from Richard's first marriage to Fanny. But during their time together, Richard and Ada had also lost a total of six children. I'm immediately curious about the children who have died. Because even when people say, well, you know, there's a higher infant mortality rate, there's, just, there's no way that that can't kill you as a parent. To happen six times, that's going to be devastating. To investigate Ada's story and the loss of so many of her children, Martin's returning to Hull, where she spent her married life. She's my great-grandmother, so she's as much a part of my story as Richard is. She was a mum raising six children, and that's not easy in any situation, and my guess is it's not made any easier by both of the parents being blind. As Martin arrives back in Hull, he receives a phone call from genealogist Jenny Thomas. Hello there. Hello, Martin. Yes. I've been having a look again at your dad's side of the family. Yeah. And I've managed to track down a living relative of Ada and Richard. Oh, really? He's called Nick Myers. Right. He is a grandson of Ada and Richard. He's the son of their daughter, Mabel. Really? OK. Blimey. And he lives in Hull. <laughs> right, yeah. Thought you might. So, I recommend that you hook him up. Yes. Try and go and see him. You never know what he might have about the family. Thank you very much, Jenny. I'm quite well boned up on Richard now, you know. Just because we haven't heard about her life yet doesn't mean she didn't have one. She had a life, presumably one beyond Richard. She was 20 years younger. Um, I guess she was around on the planet after he was. Hi. Hello, Martin. Uh, Mick, nice, is it? Nice to see you. Very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Thank you. Come in anyway. Okay. Yes, yeah, come in then. Thanks, Martin. Martin. That's yeah, yeah, Adrian as well. That, I think that's not your 1930s something. That's a great picture. Yeah. So, do you know anything about how uh, Richard and Ada would have met? Well, the story from the family is that. Uh, Grandma was singing on uh, Victoria Pier, and, and Richard heard her singing, and he was attracted by that, and got talking to her, and then that's how it all developed. Wasn't it? <laughs> it was amazing to see that he had married a, a much younger blind girl, you know, mm. who was also musical. Yeah, because she used to busk around the uh, theatres in Hull. There was the Timley Theatre, yeah. Little Theatre, which is the new theatre mm. now. She used to go around the queues busking. Do you remember your grandparents at all? I remember Grandma, really. Yeah. yeah. She passed about in the house and she, mm. could, do, she could cook, mm. do the washing, all sorts of things. He would be blind. And she could, you know, sew. Mm. She used to thread needles, put them in a tongue and, and put the thread through. Like that, how she really? did it, I don't really? know. Really? There's, there's another photograph. Now, this you know, Grandma, Ada, yeah. she's reading the Braille newspaper. She, get, she used to get the Radio Times yeah. and a, a newspaper. She used to get books from the... Uh, library at uh, Manchester, yeah. big braille books, and she used to read them all, the Daphne B. Murray and yeah. Wuthery Heights and things like that, really? and Charles Dickens. And Did she? She just read it, you know, I mean, it was marvellous. Yeah. Really. Uh, and you, was she blind from birth? Well, she went, no, about, I think about three, because uh, she had yeah. some eye trouble, really? and her mother put some drops in. This is the story I've heard. Yeah. And uh, they didn't, you know, they made, you know, sent her blind, actually, so... It was a bit of a tragedy. God, that's horrendous. Yeah. Blimey. Do you know when, um, well, Grandad Richard died? When, when did In he... In 1915. Was it? Yeah. So he was about 64 or something. Because well, he was 20 years older than Grandma. Yeah, he was, yeah. Grandma uh, married a, a Mr Ellis in 1923. Really? And he was an organist <laughs> as well, a musician. Was he? Yeah. yeah. Was he? Yeah. And then she married another, uh, Grandad Rhodes, in 1940. Really? So she was a wartime bride. You know? <laughs> so she was married twice after Richard? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's amazing. It's, it's amazing, the fact that she, she's embarking here, she's embarking on another life, mm. having already mm. done all the things she's done. <laughs> oh, that's fascinating.
I know Ada better than I know anyone in this story now because I've just spoken to Mick. And uh, once you have that human contact, it becomes tangible and it becomes like a, a real person and really, really not very far removed. She looks like quite an amazing woman, really. No, they packed a lot in, Richard and Ada. Uh, and had a lot of awful, dreadful tragedy, tragedy as far as um, losing children is concerned. I mean, I, I'm curious about how they died. I mean, I, first and foremost, as a human being and as a father, I don't think you could not be moved by children dying at an obscenely young age. I have no idea why they died or how they died. Um, but yeah, of course, I'd be curious to know. I don't anticipate finding out the answer, though. Martin's back in London to see if he can find out more about what caused the deaths of Ada and Richard's children. He's managed to find some documents to help him in his investigation. I have death certificates for four of their children. I can't really make out the cause of deaths on them. Uh, I mean, even if I could, I probably wouldn't quite understand the words themselves. So I'm going to go and speak to somebody who can help me with those. I'm going to speak to a doctor now. Martin's come to Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital to meet paediatric consultant Dr. Vaz Novelli to find out why by 1911 six of Ada and Richard's 12 children had died. Some certificates here. We've managed to, to track down four of them. These are them, I think, chronological. Right. Order. The infant mortality rate around that time would be uh, around 15, 20 percent. Oh. I would expect uh, uh, one in five to one in six children to yeah. die, not, not uh, 50 uh -uh. percent. Yeah. Not, not, yeah. So that, that is unusual. So this is Alice. This is the first one that died, This is yeah? the first one yeah. who died, apparently, yeah. So um, that was 1902. 1902 and uh, aged two months, months yeah. right. And with, with the cause of death, inanition and syncope. I mean, inanition is not a, a term we, we tend to use today. No. It, it basically means failure to thrive. So, so that was the first one. And then That's you've the first got... One. Um, then this is Hilda. She died in 1904. Um, okay, what, so I don't know what that says. So that just, that just says premature birth. This is the third this one. This here is it? Donald Walter. Yeah, that's Merasmus. That's just the same as in addition, in a way. It means uh, lack of um, uh, basically a child who's not thriving, who's mm. losing weight as such. So this is the fourth one. Well, this is Arthur. Right, so he was three hours. Three hours. That's, that's, yeah. And it's got it's also in addition. And, you know, I think putting the, th the four together, yeah. um, looking at these, you know, there's, there's, I think there's an underlying process which led to these uh, uh, infants not thriving and not being able to suckle properly and not yeah. putting weight on right. and dying in those first couple of months. So then the, you say, well, what could be the cause of this? Uh, congenital abnormalities, mm. um, you know, cardiac defects, mm. renal defects. You wouldn't expect f four in a row or five, mm. In, mm. five in a row to mm. have that. No. Could it be genetic, mm. genetic, metabolic, pro possibly? Mm. You'd expect a one in four involvement in that situation. Mm. This doesn't appear to be mm -hmm. cholera or mm -hmm. typhoid. Mm -hmm. They would have, they would have recognised that. Mm -hmm. The other common infections would be. Um, Whooping cough, mm. they'd recognise that. Mm. Uh, measles, mm. they'd recognise that. Diphtheria, upper ear's obstruction with diphtheria, they'd recognise that. Mm -hmm. The sort of infections that would be more difficult to pick up would be something like tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like your great grandma seemed to be mm. pretty good nick. Yeah. So she doesn't sound like she had, yeah. you know, consumption. One other thing that probably needs to be considered would mm. be something like syphilis. Uh, mm. Congenital syphilis. Congenital syphilis is very, very common in mm. this area. I think that's a possibility. Um, I mean, I, you know, I think I've, I've seen congenital syphilis about uh, two cases in the last five years. Mm. It, it's very, very mm. unusual. Mm. I'm not the best expert mm. in that area. I think the best person for you to talk to next would probably would be mm. uh, a sexual health expert. Really? Okay. Now I'm getting pretty sure that syphilis played a part in it. I, of course I'm curious about that. It's more surprising when you've been finding out very family stuff about these people, especially about Ada. The fact she was this strong, matriarchal, very upright um, 
talented woman who outlived everybody, you know. Um, again, because I don't know, I'm not a doctor, I don't know if you can have syphilis and live that long, I don't know. And, and not show symptoms of it, that maybe you just pass them on to, you pass those symptoms on to children, but why didn't she pass them on to the ones that survived, and how did she live to be 90-odd, in really good health, you know. Martin's on his way to the Royal Society of Medicine. I just think there's too many deaths here to put it down to, oh, that's just the olden days, infant mortality. You know? The percentage of the children they lost is way higher than the, the average of the time. And also, as Dr Novelli said, it's very rare to have that many deaths and then that many children who live. Martin's meeting Peter Greenhouse a member of the British Association for Sexual Health and HIV, who's been doing some research into Richard and Ada's case. Right. Cheers. Well, we've got some interesting stuff for you here. Great. You've actually got the list of the family okay, here. Okay, yeah. And the general rule is that wherever you see a big gap... Yes. ..in a family... Yes. ..you have to think that it might be syphilis. Really? You, when there's a big gap. Jeez, Let's really? have a look through. You've got a live and healthy chap. Yep. Yep, so he's OK. He's OK. He's OK. And then you've lost one, two, three, four that you know about. Yes, yes. Yes. And possibly two other children, all of them early deaths. Yes. All of them early deaths. And your first healthy child is here. So what's the gap? We're looking at a gap of eight years. Yes. So eight, you've got eight years yes. here. And then a whole lot of reasonably healthy children. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that very much looks like it could be syphilis. There's really? hardly anything else that would explain that. Really? And there's, it's explained by a thing called Kasowitz's Law, which was uh, described in 1875. Right. The law of the spontaneous, gradual diminution in intensity of syphilitic transmission. Right. So, basically, you, get, you tend to get a number of children who just don't get who are miscarriages. Yeah. You then have stillbirths. Yeah. You then have unhealthy children who die quickly, right. then unhealthy children, children who live, and yeah. then completely healthy children. Really? So it kind That's of gets itself out of its system? Eventually, it? yes. It right. takes about four to six years. Blimey. Uh, and it's a long time. Well, let me ask an absolute yeah. bottom-line layman's question. Go on, then. What is syphilis and Sy how exactly right. do you get it? OK. Syphilis is a sexually, <sighs> sexually transmitted infection. It's a bug that you get from past, you pass on when you have sex. Most people who had syphilis didn't realise it and passed it on unknowingly. The first recorded cases of syphilis were in southern Europe in the 1490s. It rapidly spread across the continent, ravaging cities and ports for over 400 years. With its devastating symptoms, its sexual means of transmission, and its extreme contagiousness, it became the most feared disease since the plague. It wasn't until the early 20th century and the arrival of penicillin that a cure was finally discovered. So what would some of the symptoms of syphilis have been? Well, some of the symptoms, they might have been very obvious. Um, and uh, here's a picture, for instance. And this is the so-called exanthema, or the pustular rash over yeah. the face. This is from a German textbook of the time, uh, about the same sort of time that, uh, that Ada was having her children. That's fairly, not Dreadful. very nice. Now, the other major thing that syphilis does uh, is to cause blindness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So quite a lot of people who were born with syphilis uh, went blind uh, five, six, seven, eight years later. Uh, and it causes a clouding over of the cornea. Right. Um, and these are the pictures um, that we Jeez. have here of, of, of blindness. Right, OK. So that may answer my next question, okay, which cool. was going to be um, the fact that Ada was blind, but as we understand, she became blind at about three years old. Ah. That, well, would that have... Could that have been syphilis or not? That could have been syphilis, right. and we've been doing a little bit of work on it. We found this. Right. Oh, right, it's her birth certificate. OK. So Ada's born 1st of November, 1872. Yep. Excellent. That doesn't tell us very much, but I have to say we found something else. OK. This is a death... ..certificate from January, 1872. Uh, and, uh, of Arthur Stanley Meldrum. Meldrum. Oh, I see. So, oh, I see. So this is her brother. This is her elder brother. Right. So he died at three months. Yep. 
Syphilis. Yep. Christ. Congenitals, that's no, that's no constitutional. Constitutional syphilis. Which means? Which means that the syphilis that he had was so obvious that they right. couldn't miss it. Jeez. It must have been blatantly obvious. So if Arthur died in January, yeah. and Ada born was born in November, she must have been conceived at the right, just after yeah. Arthur died. Yeah. Which means that there's a very strong chance that she might have had syphilis. She might have been born with syphilis, right. lived with it, not apart from perhaps the blindness been seriously harmed yeah. by it. So clarify for me then, um, Ada, it looks like, could have been born with syphilis. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, it works itself out. That's right. Yep. Um, uh, but then she can catch it again. Yeah, Richard. just because you've had it before doesn't yeah. mean to say you can't catch it again. Yeah. For this to happen, yeah. she must have caught it from Richard. Yeah, really, yeah. So she would have had syphilis twice in her life. Once she was born with it and once when yep. she was infected with Sadly. it. Sadly. How, how long did she live? Till about 90. Well, she had a pretty good innings then. Yeah, very good innings. At, at the time that this family were around, 100 years ago, about one in ten people in Britain had syphilis. Mm. And you could almost say that, that, that if 10% if of people had syphilis, mm. then 10% of people doing gene genealogy searches mm. have a sporting chance of finding it somewhere in their family yeah, tree. Okay, yeah. So yeah. you're not the only one. The thing was with Richard and Ada, I don't know if they know they had it. I mean, they, they probably didn't know they had it. And amazing still that she lived to be in her 90s, uh, having had syphilis twice and been blind all her life. So, yeah, I mean, she was tremendously unlucky in a lot of ways, but, um, but also she lived to see her children grow up and have grandchildren. So, like everything in life, there's the other side of it, which is very blessed, I suppose. Everything I know about my father's side of the family, pretty much everything, has happened on this journey. So it's a lot to take in in a short space of time. And some of it's been really exhilarating, and some of it's been shocking. You kind of wonder how many other extraordinary characters everyone's got in their family, you know, that we're all that we're all made up of these extraordinary people.